Welcome back, my lovely listener, to The Diaries of June. Another episode, another adventure with my Nana June, told in her very own words. How have you been, friend? Can you believe we've already journeyed together through eight of Nana June's diary entries? On a little meta note, I've been trying to decide how many episodes I should record, and ten seems like a nice round number. It's funny. This podcasting thing started as a hobby. But now, now I'm thinking 10 episodes is only season one. What do you think? Would you come along for season two? If you have any thoughts, let me know. I'd love to hear your feedback. It's been business as usual here on Orchid Island doing my post-breakup, single gal in a mansion thing, exploring and cleaning up here and there. I kind of feel like the protagonist in a rom-com. And a little bit like Belle in Beauty and the Beast, minus the Beast. Half because I'm going just a little crazy alone, singing to the furniture. And half because I love going through the old books around here. It's that wonderful old book smell, you know? A little musty, but that's part of the charm. I love how connected to Nana June I feel when I'm flipping through a book she held 100 years ago. I even found her old school books. There was one in particular, a geography book, with an inscription inside the cover in this gorgeous cursive writing. Don't let your silly father plan your life. Find your own path, it said. Crazy, right? Who the heck was telling Nana June not to listen to her father? Definitely no one in the family. I did some detective work matching handwriting samples from old letters and paperwork, and not a single match. Color me curious. I thought Nana June might be able to shed some light on the mysterious inscription. So I went searching through the diary for clues. And I think I figured it out. Apparently Nana June's father, George, hired a summer tutor for her when she was 16, just a year before she moved to London. And if it weren't for that tutor, Nana June might never have left Orchid Island. Have I piqued your interest, listener? I know I'm excited to tell you the tale, so let's dive in. July 5th, 1906. Dear Diary, Father hired a summer tutor for me, and at first I was miserable about the idea. It's summer! I'm meant to enjoy our time off, not spend it studying. Claire never had to have a summer tutor. But Father thought my final marks for the year were less than stellar, especially in geography. He's not wrong, I suppose. But what does it matter? What use do I have for geography, except to be the wife of some dull property baron? That's probably Father's line of thinking. Can't have his daughter mixing up capitals while being courted by one of his associate's sons. The embarrassment. (laughs) Besides, it wasn't even my fault that I barely passed. My geography teacher hated me, plain and simple. I was late on my first day of the semester, and she treated me horribly from there on out. She made it her mission to call on me for only the most difficult questions. What's the capital of Turkey? How far do the Carpathian Mountains stretch across Europe? Who cares? I'm never going to use that sort of knowledge in real life while, um, I don't know, a typist or whatever sort of dreadfully boring future I'm sure to have. When my new tutor arrived on a warm, sunny Wednesday morning, a morning I much rather would have spent by the sea, I had to admit she wasn't what I was expecting. I'd intended to give her the same argument about the uselessness of geography, but all thoughts of it flew from my mind at the sight of her as Mrs. Talbot ushered her into the conservatory. 
unlike the teachers at St. Prudence, with their high collars and tight matronly hairdos. My new tutor seemed to have stepped straight out of a fashion magazine. Her long auburn hair fell in loose curls around the stylish lace bust of her dress, cut in the modern style. She wore lipstick and rouge, something you'd never find in the classrooms at St. Prudence, and carried a men's leather book bag. She noticed me staring and smiled. Italian leather, picked up in Rome last fall. Men's cut, yes, but much more practical. She extended a gloved hand, also leather a perfect match to her bag, for me to shake. Gina Lorraini. Don't you dare call me Mrs. Lorraini. I'm not married and never plan to be. Gina is fine. I liked her immediately. Now, on a lovely summer day like this, the last thing we're going to do is open a book, she said breezily. I stared at her, wondering how father had come to find her. Did he know how unorthodox his new hire was? As if reading my mind, Gina continued. Don't worry, we'll get your marks up before the fall. I'm excellent at what I do, or else your father wouldn't have hired me. Now, she said, stretching her arms overhead. Let's take today's class along the water. Come. I had a thousand questions for her. Who was she? Where did she come from? How could she be so... different? She was unlike anyone I'd ever seen, ever met, ever could have fathomed existed. More like a character in a novel, and entirely less like a schoolteacher. I never find myself struck shy, diary. You know as well as anyone. But I couldn't bring myself to ask her about herself. I merely trotted along next to her, in awe of her self-possession. Even her walk was so sure of itself, striding confidently along the sand, leaving perfect, strong footprints. I... I started, trying to find my tongue. She turned to face me as I shook my head and tried to clear the confusion. I wasn't expecting someone like you. She laughed, bright and big, her hair shaking over her shoulders. <laughs> yes, uh, I get that a lot. I am not an ordinary teacher. I say life teaches by experiences lived. So I live a lot. Write that down later. It's the most important fact you'll ever learn. As we walked along the beach, she told me all about herself, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. A childhood as a traveling musician in a family band. A teen starlet and fashion model. Heiress to the family fortune. But so bored. Everything planned for me. Too easy. So I took up teaching, she said as she bent to examine a seashell. Scallop, one of the most delicious mollusks in the world. You can find them on nearly every continent. I love the way they prepare them in Napoli. Hint of olive oil, lemon, basil. Oh, such a treat. I asked her if she'd traveled to every continent, and she let loose another bubble of laughter. <laughs> Almost! <laughs> Antarctica is last on my list. Come winter, I'll go study with an explorer and mountaineer in Cape Froward. We'll prepare for an expedition next year. Wow. I breathed. Where is Cape Froward? Aha. And we've arrived at the geography lesson. Gina winked and tapped her elbow against mine. Cape Froward is the southernmost point of the South American mainland. In Chile. I marveled for a moment, interested in geography for perhaps the first time in my life. And you'll study there? For Antarctica? I couldn't imagine it. Won't it be miserably cold? It will be cold, she agreed. But the misery is optional. 
The adventure is exciting. I could be one of the first women to visit Antarctica, you know. She paused for a moment to stare out at the water, shielding her eyes against the sun. Between you and I, though, I don't think they'll let me go. Have you heard of Ernest Shackleton? I shook my head. He's an explorer. He's planning to man, keyword, man, the first expedition to Antarctica. They don't let us delicate women along for these kinds of manly journeys. But I'll study in Chile anyway, and we'll see if they can bend the rules. She winked and tapped my elbow again. If not, I'll find something else to explore. Antarctica will still be there when the world decides women aren't as fragile as the ice. I couldn't believe it. Gina was so, so different from any other woman I'd met. She was out in the world doing whatever she wanted, and with such a blasé attitude. I envied her, admired her, and a little bit found myself wanting to be her. We spent the remainder of the day talking about the place she'd seen in South America, and what she loved most about Chile. And that's how all of our lessons have gone since, Diary. For the last six weeks, she's arrived every Wednesday with a fabulous story about somewhere she's been or plans to go. Places I'd never heard of now suddenly rattle around my head. So vivid I can smell them. Like the Spice Bazaar in Constantinople or the Tulip Fields in Holland. Next time the spinsters at St. Prudence asked, I'd be sure to have the answer to the capital of Turkey. I could never forget it after hearing Gina's stories of bartering for turmeric with hashish. In another lesson, Gina told me of a rice farm she'd visited in rural China, thousands of miles away from the nearest major city. After taking a train to a boat, she'd ridden the back of a donkey for four days to arrive at the remote village. When the sun rises there, she told me with a wistful look of longing, the whole mountain glows. Reflections in the rice ponds, you see. You must go there someday. I never knew the world had so much color and life diary. I'd known only London and New York, but not what I was missing beyond my two homes. All of my protesting against learning geography now seems so embarrassing, ignorant. Why had I wanted to shut myself off from knowing such wonderful things? Yesterday, Gina brought me a textbook. A necessary evil, she said with one of her usual winks. But one that will help you to plan adventures of your own someday. As someone once told me, an adventure starts with a story overheard and continues with a map. I can name two dozen countries now and their capitals. I can tell you the best route from Marseille to Amsterdam when you're a stowaway in a gypsy caravan. Something I almost got away with, Gina told me. Except the trunk I was hiding in was dusty. I sneezed in the middle of a tarot reading. She's just full of anecdotes and adventures like that. I can't wrap my head around it. Had she been a man, of course, I wouldn't have questioned her ability to move around the world at such ease. But here she is, a single woman, alone, traversing the continents. How? I turned the question over and over in my mind for weeks, trying to find the right way to ask it. We were sat in the reading room yesterday, waiting out a summer squall, and Gina was telling me about her time in India. I miss the food most of all, especially the breads, she was saying, but I wasn't paying attention. I was stuck on my question and determined to find a way to ask it. I'd intended to frame it carefully, but it tumbled out of me crass and uninformed. How are you able to do all this? You're a woman. I slapped my hand over my mouth, mortified. I mean, 
But Gina only laughed, as she so often did, and looked at me kindly. <laughs> I don't let that stop me. Simple as that. But, I started, sure there was more to it. June, Bella, we are here and now. We don't know what happens after we die, but we know we are here and now. So if there's something you want in this short, short life, you go after it, simple as that. With a wink and an elbow knock, as always, she smiled at my stupor. I never thought about it like that, I told her, and I hadn't. I had thought about what father wants for me, and about what I don't want, but what I do want, what future I could choose for myself if there was nothing stopping me, if there were no expectations, no rules, no propriety to consider, I had no idea what I'd choose. Perhaps sensing my inner monologue, Gina tapped my textbook. You can make any path you want, June, truly. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I never would have believed it, diary. But geography lessons have become the highlight of my summer. I can't wait for next week and the next story from this magnificent, marvelous modern woman. I might not know exactly what I want out of life just yet. But if it's half as exciting as Gina's life, I'll be on the right track. Would you believe, Nana June, that we feel the same way about you? I absolutely love this entry. This is it, the turning point in Nana June's life. The magnificent mentor who teaches her that she can be anything, woman or not, even in the 1900s. Oh, what a lady. I'm going to Google this Gina later and see if she ever made it to Antarctica. It's so important to have strong mentors in life. That's kind of how I feel about Nana June, you know? I mean, I know, we're in the modern age and I can open my laptop to a million amazing role models, but it's a little different when there's a personal connection. And even if Nana June and I can't have a dialogue, we can have this. She can still inspire me to find my path. You might remember from the last episode that I'm uh, kind of pathless right now. I'm not sure that I want to go back to my job in San Francisco or back to practicing law at all. Ugh. I kind of feel like 16-year-old Nana June, and she's my Gina, teaching me that I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Ooh, you know what? I'm gonna spend some time with Nana June's geography book tonight. I think it'll be cool to check off every place she's ever been. Or as many places as I know about, anyway. Between her diary, letters, old newspaper clippings, and scraps of ticket stubs I found, I think I can piece together a pretty solid approximation of her adventures. And maybe in charting out Nana June's path, I'll see a path of my own I might want to take. If I figure it out before the next episode, I'll tell you about it, listener. And hey, if you're inspired to make a path of your own, tell me about it. I'd love to hear from you. Bye for now, June crew. And stay tuned for the next episode. It might be the last, or just the last for the season, this podcast is finding its path to. Wherever our journey takes us, I hope you've enjoyed the ride so far.
This has been June's Journey, The Lost Diaries, from Wooga. You can step into June Parker's shoes and become the detective herself in June's Journey, the number one hidden object game in the world. Live the glamorous 1930s life as you journey around the world, finding hidden objects, adventure, and even a little romance. Download June's Journey for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Thanks for listening.